first I wanted to start off by talking about um, the Methodist Church in Great Britain. I didn't uh, get explicit. I had a, a gentleman write me from Great Britain about the context there. This this week, of course, a lot of people are looking at them because they came out with this pronouncement about no longer using the terms husband and wife, and we'll talk about that after this. But I wanted to take a few minutes um, to... I, he, he took the time to explain what the context is over there and maybe help folks understand why it is that the Global Methodist Church really is such a valiant effort, and it's, it's, it's quite complicated. So anyway, I didn't hear back from this gentleman to uh, tell people his name or anything, so I'm, I'm not going to have his letter on the screen. I don't want to give away any personal details about him, but I'm going to read his letter and then um, make sure that, that we understand it. So um, he says, uh, I'm now in Zoom contact with a group of Global Methodist ministers and some local preachers and other lay folk. There have been two meetings so far in which we've discussed how a global Methodist president, uh, presence might be affected in Great Britain. Um, the two main difficulties arise in these conversations. One is the ministers who have already shifted to the global Methodist church are supernumeraries. That's a fancy word for older folks and therefore have nothing to lose by way of employment or by losing their manses, or that's parsonages. Some still will preach occasionally in the Methodist Church in Great Britain chapels on invitation, but it is not difficult for them to go over to the GMC. That's not exactly a problem, is it? But it's still interesting. Two, the nature of the connectional organization in the Great Britain uh, conference— uh, in parentheses, all Ireland has a separate conference. That's interesting. It's so different from the United Methodist or Global Methodist system that when we met with them on Zoom, it seemed to be difficult for the GMC leadership to grasp how different our two systems are. While it is possible for Presbyterian ministers and presumably diaconal ministers to transfer over, there is no mechanism for lay folk, which includes our thousands of local preachers, should they wish to. To do so. So he's going to come back to this notion of um, local preachers being considered laity and not clergy in Great Britain. He has a point three. The 1977 changes, and this is interesting, of constitution shifted all property from local trusts into the hands of the then property division of the church. That's a that that's a proper noun. P capital P capital D capital C. This is contained within the Methodist Church Act of 1977, an act of parliament, which would require civil legislation to amend. So no congregation could ever leave and take their chapel away from them. We would have no church buildings, so church planting would needs be the approach. This is very different. When you're talking about only older clergy can transfer and not lady, I still don't understand that but then you can't take any real estate with you. You have to plant all these churches. That sounds quite difficult to me. So um, be be in prayer for British Methodists, um, because <laughs> can you imagine being a Brid British Methodist and the news cycle is saying they don't even call men and women husbands and wives anymore. They're just supposed to be partners or whatever. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, he goes on, as disaffected Methodist lay folk, we have nowhere to go. The Wesleyan Reform Union circuits are way up in the north of England, as are those of the Independent Methodist Connection. There are some free Methodist churches now, stemming from U.S. origin, but are few and far between. So um, the Global Methodist Church is looking at making inroads there, but it looks like even if they establish themselves as a legal entity in Great Britain, they're going to be planting all the new churches and using only those who can get free and transfer over in that way. In case you missed that point three, the federal government and Great Britain got involved and made it so that there are no more local trusts. They can't choose to sign over their building to another denomination. That is now through a federal agency that it seems is difficult to work through. So we thought we had it rough in America. This is nigh impossible uh, unless they have some legal means. Which, by the way, I think I have a report coming up on Arkansas. Their legislature 
uh, approve some um, legislation that makes it possible for local churches to disaffiliate from denominations, regardless of what the language in the denomination says. So I haven't looked into that enough. I will. I'll report on it. This guy had some um, reflections on American Methodism. He says, I did not realize till joining your um, plain spoken what the differences between the UK, United Kingdom, and the United States are. I was really surprised to discover the the development of the differences between the UK and the US Methodist systems was actually begun well before the American War of Independence. So the MEC was formed, Methodist Episcopal Church in America, was formed long before any official Methodist church in Britain was formed. It was still a Methodist movement in Great Britain. Even into the early part of the 19th century, many Methodists were hoping for a reunion with the Church of England. Thus, Methodist churches continued to be held outside church time so members might also attend their parish church. This is all very interesting history. Um, With respect to British Methodism, he says, while an Episcopal system in name developed in the U.S., in Britain, Wesley's system of society, circuits, and circuit superintendents developed and has been maintained ever since. So they're more old school in that way. Even in all the breakaway Methodist groups of the 19th century, Episcopacy in the church in Great Britain is seen in the function of the conference and its appointed circuit superintendents. Groups of circuits form a district, which will have a district chair, formerly a chairman, but he or she has no actual authority over the conference appointed circuit superintendent. See, and a lot of people are zoning out because of all these uh, titles. Can you imagine what it is for... Uh, non-United Methodists or non-global Methodists, every group has its own terminology. Uh, He says it appears that the lack of ministers, or rather the ratio of ministers to chapels, compels the nature of the church to be more lay-led than in the U.S. The main difference, therefore, seems to be that in the U.K., the lay folk run the chapels. The ministers in the early years being appointed by the conference for just one or two years before moving on, when I first came... To our local Methodist church, ministers were appointed to the circuit for three years. With a possible extension to five, ministers were appointed to the circuit, and the circuit decided which societies they should serve. The system is still the same, though. The initial period is now five years. Anyway, he gets into a lot of particulars here that I found immensely interesting. He gets into um, Methodist class meetings. I might pick up on this later, but um, the the things that I, I wrote him back about I said, how is it that it's mostly lay-led, and yet it seems so captured by far-left progressive ideology? Because here in America, the lay areas, non-clergy areas, lean right. They still have some salt-of-the-earth common sense. It's only in the the trained clergy that you see this drift leftward. So I wonder, have they worked it out so only the, trained, the few trained clergy they have in Great Britain are making these decisions, and the laity or laity or along for the ride. I haven't heard from him yet, so I might uh, come back to this uh, later. Paul says, most um, Methodists in Great Britain do not read the directives from conference. That is so interesting to me. 